For the next uh, topic, uh, we'll continue on from sustainability to nature and delve into the idea of how we can learn from nature and how it can teach us about our surroundings and by observing it, we can build more innovative and sustainable solutions. So I'm welcoming to the virtual stage, Alessandro Biancardi, the co-founder at Planet SAS, uh, an environmental engineer with more than 25 years of experience in the identification and management of the environment and sustainable development projects at an international level. So welcome Alessandro and his uh, keynote, Biomimicry, learning from the genius of nature. Good morning, everybody. Thanks a lot for uh, allow me to participate to this uh, very interesting uh, and important event. Um, let me uh, start uh, with the presentation. Just a second. Okay. Um, can I share the screen? Okay. Can you see the screen? Nope. Okay. So I'll try again. Uh, just a second. Okay, so good morning, everybody. So what I'm going to present you today, it's, a, it's another option to do innovation and to do it in a more sustainable, possibly in a more sustainable way. And it's indeed uh, um, consulting nature, take ideas from nature and try to convert them into more sustainable innovation. Um, it's not only about uh, um, incremental innovation, but it could be also disruptive innovation. Let me start uh, with uh, showing you this image. This is uh, Modern Time of Charlie Chaplin, a pretty old uh, movie of the 1936. But what I wanted you to focus is on, on the gear, which is uh, the gear it's, uh, somehow is the, the symbol of, uh, of a mechanism, the, single, the, the, the symbol at that time of progress. And uh, in a way, it was the, the tool, the, the design that allowed uh, human technology to progress. In fact, we don't know the origin of this design of the of the gear. Uh, already, of course, Leonardo da Vinci was using it. Uh, um, Archimedes was using it, and it seems that even the Chinese, a couple of thousand of years ago, already were using this type of, of technology. Now, something like five or six years ago, someone took this picture with the microscope. Now, this is a gear. It's a mechanism. The only difference from our mechanism is that this one is inside this. It's inside this uh, uh, little creature, which is a plant hopper. And uh, this particular mechanism, this gear, allow this grass hopper to synchronize the of its leg in order to go straight when it jumps. So basically they are the bones of uh, these two posterior uh, 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 legs that basically they synchronized themselves. So as you can see, if we thought that the gear was an achievement, a great achievement of our uh, um, genius, uh, of our capacity to invent, as a matter of fact, millions of years ago, nature had already thought about it. So now let's uh, start about uh, the topic uh, entering uh, in, into this. So there are different definition about bioinspiration. You could hear about biomimicry, biomimetics, bio, biologically inspired design. One of the definition that I like to consider is that uh, learning from nature and then emulating natural forms, process and ecosystems to solve problems. Now, bio biomimicry uh, positions itself between nature, biology, and design, innovation, and sustainability. Now, why we do, why, let's say, look at nature to find ideas? 
So as a matter of fact, nature throughout uh, the evolution of the last four billion years, in fact, it has to face similar challenges that we are facing. Nature has to access energy, has to manage waste, has to access water, has to build structure, manufacture stuff, and also respond to risks and crises. So basically, we have a fairly the same problem that nature had. So why consulting nature? Again, because nature had the four billion years of research and development through trials and errors. So all the solution that in fact didn't work are now basically fossils. Secondly, nature has optimal solution to complex problems because nature doesn't solve, it didn't solve one single problem at a time, but it had to deal with the complexity of the surrounding environment. And then throughout the billions of years, it succeeded in developing solution which are adapted to solve complex problems. Then uh, the problems are solved in a sustainable way. If we think about it, nature is the only truly sustainable uh, example that we have uh, on the planet. And lastly, let's not forget that we have 1.5 million species to take inspiration from on how they solve a problem of which and then additional 7 million of species that have been estimated and not yet discovered. So a huge tank, a huge reservoir of ideas, of inspirations. I would like to make a differentiation now between what is called the nature-based solution and the biomimicry. So if you take a tree to remove a carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, this is a nature-based solution. So we used nature to do that. Differently, biomimicry, it's take inspiration from the leaf of a tree and reproduce it technologically to carry out the same function. Now, there are different uh, uh, paths or way to approach biomimicry. You can use nature as a model. So you can, as I mentioned, uh, emulate, take inspiration from nature and then solve the problem and develop technology process. You can use nature as a measure, meaning that you can measure your technology, your process against certain ecological standard. And it re respond to the reply to the question, would nature do that? And then you can decide if you want to improve or change your technology in order to be more aligned with natural principles. And the third is to use nature as a mentor. So this is about the ethical level. So how to embed in your own ethical uh, uh, behavior, some natural principle in order to be more sustainable. Let me now uh, illustrate and go through uh, highlighting the difference between uh, how we design as a human society and how nature designs. Let's look at natural resource management. We tend to uh, move resources around the globe. So uh, the resources are taken globally and moved around and for the majority, they are not renewable. Nature that does differently. It uh, use locally available resources and obviously renewable. Here, example of a cactus that is collecting the rainwater that it's uh, falling on him very rarely, but his design is done on purpose to gather this water as quickly as possible and to store it. Now we are still uh, designing our production process through a linear uh, productive cycle. So from the land to the landfill, of course, we are doing recycling scheme. So we are kind of going closer to what we call the circular economies, but the path is still quite uh, uh, far. Nature does obviously circular economy. Everything in nature is circular. Everything transformed and it's used by others. So as we know, virtually there is no waste in nature. Our manufacturing process is done through these uh, three process. We heat, we beat, and we treat. So we heat uh, at higher temperature, temperature materials, we beat it to give it the shape, and we treat it with chemicals. 
which more often, I mean, often they are, of course, toxic to, to the environment. Nature does completely different. Nature uses a life-friendly, water-based green chemistry. Here you see the net of a, of a spider, which is made of proteins, um, is of course uh, made at room temperature. You don't have to eat it up, uh, up to thousand degrees. And uh, once the net has finished is a function, actually the spider eat it and produce it again. And as we know now, science is telling us that the, the net, the, the silk of the spider has the same properties of uh, toughness of Kevlar. Here, for example, I show you the periodic table of the element. This is what we use to manufacture our products, our goods. Basically, we use almost all the periodic table. Nature, as a matter of fact, use mainly four elements, which are extremely abundant all over the universe, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Then it uses also other elements, but in minor quantity, in order to give additional functionality, which could not provided through this uh, uh, through the main four elements. Um, so as you can see, nature use abundantly available element. Another principle that uh, we tend to use is the blueprint approach. So one design that is okay for all the collation, all, 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 all the context. Here I took this example of the glass skyscraper. These are glass skyscrapers taken in different places around the world with different context, different climatic uh, conditions. But as you can see, it's basically the same design. It's concrete, steel, and glass, a lot of glass. And obviously the impact of this, uh, this type of structure um, is due to the high consumption of energy to regulate the temperature. Now nature, does differently. Nature is adaptable. The design of nature is adaptable to local condition. Nature use what is available there in order to design and to build. Here, for example, this uh, little creature is a cut this fly. And at its uh, larval stage, uh, he has to create his own uh, house. And uh, as you can see the different picture, it created different houses using different materials, which was available locally. On the upper uh, picture, actually, you can see that someone try uh, put the, the caddis fly larva into some uh, gold nugget and other uh, stones, and they created uh, the jewels. So, just to summarize, uh, here you, I can see, I, I re repeated the difference between a human design and, uh, and the nature design. So ultimately, human design is still not sustainable. Rather, compared to nature design, which is more actually than sustainable, I would say that it creates conditions conducive to life. So when we take decision, uh, using this natural design principle, I believe there are more chances for embedding sustainability in your design, creating circular economies, developing inclusive societies, um, embed uh, um, adaptation and resilience to changes in your design, and also allows you to preserve and regenerate ecosystem services. So we don't need necessarily to emulate a single organism, but we can already use general design principle that, new, that nature utilizes in order to inform our design. That can be a product, it can be a process, it can be a policy, it can be an organizational structure. Now let's go a bit more into detail uh, of, the, of the process of biomimicry. As I mentioned, biomimicry, it's uh, emulating natural forms processes and ecosystem to solve problems. So I wanted to give you some example of this. Um, basically the process uh, in few words is identify biological solution and translate them in a technical language to generate ideas for non-biological solution. Let's start with the emulation of forms. Now, if I show you this uh, picture where you can see these three uh, products, 
Now they all look like some organisms. As a matter of fact, this is not an emulation of an organism because the emulation concern um, replicating the function that this organism was carrying out. In these cases, having a house with the shape of the dog doesn't give uh, any additional function to the house, but just an aesthetic aspect. The same for the pig that contains the, the coins and also the head that look like a, a parrot. If you look at the example of emulation of four, so here we have the shark. Uh, the shark is covered with a skin which has this particular shape. It has these particular riblets, uh, which are called dermal denticles. And it turns out that these denticles, aside from giving the shark and hydrodynamic uh, uh, properties, is also antibacterial. So the, the bacteria, basically, they are not able to colonize this type of surface. So a company replicated this uh, type of pattern, engineered this pattern, and put it on imprinted on polymers surfaces, creating so naturally antibacterial surfaces. And you can imagine having this property embedded in the surface allows you to avoid using a lot of soap, a lot of uh, uh, toxic uh, uh, material in order to clean the surface. Another example is taken from the humpback whale from the fin. You could see that the fin of the humpback whale has some bumps on the front, which uh, from an engineering point of view, hydrodynamic point of view, they would be a bit counterintuitive because having that type of bump on the front, they might generate turbulence. However, uh, it was studied the hydrodynamic of the fin of the humpback whale, and it turns out that that bump in fact, help the, the, the whale to, um, uh, to swim more, uh, uh, more easily, basically allow to reduce turbulence rather than creating them. And the company decided to copy the same uh, uh, design and to put it on the um, wind propellers. So taking inspiration from an organism that is in the sea, it was created a, pro a product that uh, actually is operating in air. And this company produced these uh, wind propellers, which are 15, 20% more efficient that, uh, than other uh, wind propellers. Now let's look at processes. Um, from the ant and from the way they organize themselves and they are looking for food and how they find the shortest path to look uh, for food, a company developed the algorithm from this behavior and develop a software for optimizing logistics. So basically companies like DHL are using this type of software in order to optimize the delivery of the packages. Um, another example of emulating process is emulating the capacity to uh, self heal of plants. Uh, they are developing now tires that are self-healing so that they have a material inside like a gel inside the tires that when the tires has a puncture, basically when the air is going out, this jelly material moves and goes to close the, the hole. And then we have in, uh, in the digital world, genetic algorithms are using of course for digital architecture and also for developing uh, um, artificial intelligence. For what concerns the emulation of ecosystem, the situation is more complex, but still we have an example. Uh, this example is uh, the industrial district in, uh, in Denmark or in uh, uh, Kalumborg. And this is considered an example of what is called industrial uh, uh, symbiosis. So basically a lot of uh, companies, they interact with each other. It's a kind of circular economy applied. And uh, the starting company was actually a, an electric power uh, station. And then slowly the byproduct of this uh, power station uh, became the input or of other companies. For example, the heat, uh, uh, exhausted heat was utilized for heating uh, um, a small town in the nearby or some heat was utilized in a fish culture was a fish culture sludge uh, went directly to a local farmer. 
some of the ashes produced by the burning of the coal of this power plant were used by a plasboard uh, company and by a cement company and so on and so forth. This was not planned. This was a process that occurred actually in, uh, in 30 years, but still is a good example on how you can reproduce an ecosystem, how different companies, they are uh, synergizing, they are uh, cooperating together for the benefit of everybody. This is a, an example of which I'm working in particular. So there are a lot of uh, dry land around the, the world um, dry land where the soil is uh, degrading, dry land, of course, because you have a lack of uh, fresh water. But many of this dry land, in many of this dry land, there is a, a high abundance of uh, saline water. So taking inspiration on, from the mangrove ecosystem, which uh, uh, obviously developed in saline water, so taking inspiration on the way this ecosystem develop and grow, we um, design, we conceive this concept that we call it the mangrove technology platform, which is a system of technology, which is combined a solar uh, desalination process, a low cost one, which allows to produce fresh water. And then the fresh water is sent to what we call organic incubator or soil enhancer. And these are different type of technology that allow the plant to grow faster and to enrich the soil, a degraded soil of its uh, substances. So basically we feed the, with, the, with the water, we feed the, this uh, organic incubator and the whole system is controlled and managed by sensor in an internet of things uh, system. So then there is another example of ecosystem uh, emulation. There are companies that are trying to plan entire city look at how ecosystems are functioning. So how resources are shared and moved around an ecosystem. They want to apply the same things to urban planning. So again, I would conclude to uh, highlight you again. So why biomimic? Why it is important? First of all, because it can boost your capacity to solve complex problems. You, then it can stimulate, obviously, creativity, lateral thinking. So using a, a biological analogy, it can allow you, helps you to think outside the box. Then it can stimulate the system thinking and multidisciplinary dialogue, because to do biomimicry, you need to involve also biologists. You need to le learn a lot about nature. And then obviously it can boost sustainable innovation and obviously competitiveness. So to conclude, I would say that uh, in practice, I mean, biomimicry is a practice that everybody should embrace, could embrace, not only engineer, not only designer, but planner, politician, governors, whoever actually, um, to look for sustainable solution, which are, in harmony, of course, with the natural ecosystem, ecosystem, of course, of which we belong to and depend upon. So with this, uh, I would conclude and thank you again very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Alessandro. Please uh, don't run off yet uh, because we have a question for you. Um, so we had a question from, uh, from uh, one of our um, participants. Why are there so many species not yet discovered and how much would that help? So I'm not a biologist to answer academically to this, uh, to this question. Um, however, it's, uh, it, it, it's a matter of exploring and find them. Now funding for biology, for discovering uh, new species, most probably it is not now perceived as a priority. So I suspect it's a, it's a problem also of funding this type of research. But nevertheless, every day, it's because we are not aware of it, but every day new species are, are, are discovered. And if, if, if I may add on this, it's, a, it's crucial to discover more species as much as this is crucial to preserve the species. Because for me, biomimicry, I mean, biological biodiversity as such is just, uh, as I mentioned before, it's a big tank of ideas. So each time that a species 
disappear, you lose an opportunity to learn something. You lose wisdom when you lose a, 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 a living uh, organism. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the very insightful presentation and getting more into a science-y part uh, with yours. Thank you, Alessandro.